There's been so much great science fiction that's come around in the last few years that's really got me and so many other readers sitting up and paying attention. And what's wonderful to see is that so much of this science fiction has been coming from women writers, queer writers, writers of colour, and writers in translation from other languages outside of English. And today I want to talk about one of those books, How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu. Science fiction has always been about pushing boundaries, exploring ethics, politics, theology, social dynamics. And this is a book that does exactly that. It's a book that clearly is paying homage to its legacy, to where science fiction has come from, to things like Star Trek and the works of writers like Arthur C. Clarke. It's a book of big, frightening ideas. It's very, very reminiscent of the works of Emily St. John Mandel, and it also has a sprinkling of Black Mirror as well. There's a lot going on here in terms of what it's like, what it's looking to do and achieve, and what makes it stand alone as a great work of modern science fiction. How High We Go in the Dark is effectively a short story collection that tells a linear narrative, which is something that I have seen a little bit in fiction, but it's not explored that often, and Sequoia Nagamatsu manages to do something really powerful with that setup. We begin about 10 years from now with a concept that is very real, a fear that is genuine amongst the scientific community right now. And that is the idea that as the permafrost melts, Illnesses, diseases, viruses that have been dormant for thousands, tens of thousands of years are going to defrost and flood our water supply. The idea that we in the near future could be up against viruses that have died out, that we have no way of combating or understanding. The idea that global warming will unleash pandemic after pandemic. That's what this book is more or less about, at least at the beginning but it's even bigger than that. We begin with a scientist who has just lost his daughter, who was also a scientist. She was in Siberia at a crater, which is a real place that is the largest area of permafrost in the world, I believe. And she is investigating the permafrost, watching it melt, and looking at how we can combat that, and also look at what diseases might be unveiled because of it. But she died. And very shortly afterwards, he's basically gone to her team, her location, to try and continue her work, continue her legacy, meet her team, look at what she was doing, and seeing what he can do. One thing that they've uncovered is the body of a girl that's about 10,000 years old, and there is a disease in her body that we do not understand, that may have infected our protagonist of this story and the other scientists. And that's where the first story pretty much ends. From here, every story kind of jumps forward a little bit in time, taking us further and further away from that moment into a society that has been affected by that disease that was unveiled by the melting of the permafrost. In the second story, we're in California, and there is this young Asian American guy who is a kind of failed stand-up comedian and has been invited to be a clown, an entertainer, at a very Black Mirror-inspired theme park. This Arctic disease mostly affects children, and it's mostly waterborne as far as they know. So people typically don't eat fish anymore or go swimming in the ocean. And quite often the people who are infected are children who did those things. And so we're in California and we've got this theme park that is a place where children can be euthanized. These children have the disease, they are slowly dying, and the way the disease works is that it transforms the cells in individual organs in your body and mutates them into other organs effectively shutting them down. So over time, your heart mutates into a lung and vice versa. It's trippy and strange and just the right amount of creepy. And the way that the euthanasia theme park works is that a child is put on a roller coaster by their parents, and while they're on the roller coaster, they feel a sense of euphoria before they pass out and die in their sleep. It's horrifying, but it does feel like a thing that could possibly exist in the future. There isn't much in here that isn't something that could be possible, and that's one of them. It feels very Black Mirror, very, very dark, but kind of possible, kind of feasible. And our protagonist is an entertainer who makes the kids laugh, makes them feel good, makes them feel happy, 
and guides them onto this roller coaster where they will be euthanized, but they don't know that, and their parents have to let them go. It's horrifying, but it feels, as I said, feasible. And then from here, every story explores different ideas and avenues of science fiction, mostly related to this disease and what it's doing to the planet. But it also deals with global warming. It is an eco-novel of sorts. And as we get further and further away from the modern day, science advances and humanity starts doing things that you would kind of expect to see in science fiction, but I don't want to give those things away. The second half of the novel takes us to very different places, but every single story in here is about a different protagonist, a different setting, a different scenario, and a slight time jump forward. So you cover quite a lot of time and ground in this book. It's a novel structured in a way that you just don't often see, and it feels like a short story collection, but it follows a very specific narrative, a specific linearity through time. But you never really get attached to these characters, and you do see characters crop up in later stories. The protagonist of that second story, the entertainer at the theme park, is briefly mentioned in another tale later on, and you see what becomes of him after the events of his narrative. This is a collection that really explores different aspects of sci-fi, things that we typically, as I said, expect to see in a lot of science fiction stories. One of them is the concept of human engineering, bioengineering, and human cognition. There is a pig that is one of many pigs that are used as test subjects to grow human organs, which will then be transplanted into the ill kids. But this pig, because of growing human organs, including a human brain, has developed a kind of speech. It has developed human-like intelligence, and it communicates through telepathy. And it communicates with the lead scientist that's been looking after it. It's a short story, and in its own little bubble, a fascinating exploration of intelligence itself. But what makes this book so unique, other than the big concepts and the way that it kind of devotes itself to the big concepts of science fiction, is its capacity for empathy and love. All of the people in these stories are very, very human. They're all fleshed out. They're very well-considered characters. They are people that you grow enormously attached to. The sci-fi elements aside, these are short stories of human connection and love. These are stories about family, stories about parents and their children, stories about people falling in and out of love, stories about people making connections that they shouldn't be making, but they can't help themselves because they're human, stories of people falling in love with other people who are dying or doomed, stories of people who are connecting with their families or reconnecting with them, even after they've died. It's incredibly human. Emotion is at the heart of this book. It is about our emotional connections with one another, the ways that we hate each other and love each other, look out for each other, fall in and out of love. It's about families and friends and lovers. That's at the heart of this. It's a very intimate book. All of the connections in here are small, narrow, this is not a big book. The ideas are huge, and the time and space that is explored is also huge, but the narratives and the connections between people are small and intimate and confined. Families, groups of friends, colleagues, lovers, they're small, intimate, important connections. It shows the importance of human connection, of relationships, while a pandemic is happening, while the world is changing, while the ice caps are melting, while people are drowning and things are flooding, while all of these catastrophes are going on, that will go on as time moves on, because this often feels like a prediction of our near future, it's about us and our connections with one another. That's at the heart of this book. And I guess that's kind of what the title is about, although, it's in the third or fourth story that you find out that the phrase how high we go in the dark is particularly literal. The third or fourth story in here is about a shared consciousness of people who slipped into a coma from the disease, and they all wake up in a dark space all together, and they literally form a human pyramid to try and climb out of this space and back into the world of the awake and the living. They literally see how high they can go in the dark. But metaphorically, that's also kind of what this title is alluding to. The world is getting darker and scarier and more intimidating and more dangerous. How high can we go? 
How far can human engineering and invention take us? How far can science take us? But also, how far can we take ourselves in terms of our connections? Can love and connection and relationships carry us through? Can they take us high enough in the dark? That's what the title is alluding to, at least in my opinion. I really, really adore the way that this book is set up, the fascinating sci-fi concepts that are explored here, just how much it reminded me of the works of Emily St. John Mandel and the Black Mirror TV show, but it's the humanity that's explored here that really got me invested. These characters, their intimate relationships, their narratives, while living in a scientifically fascinating and very, very dangerous, horrible, diseased world. It really, really got me thinking, and more importantly, feeling. How High We Go in the Dark is a wonderful book. And as a small side note, I really like the fact that the author is a Japanese-American writer whose characters are all almost exclusively Japanese-American or Japanese. This is an author who has Japanese heritage, who grew up in Hawaii and Northern California, and almost all of the stories and characters and narratives are all based around Japan, Hawaii, Northern California, and Minnesota, where he lives now. I thought that was really cool. He's really feeding off of his own personal experiences in terms of space, but also in terms of culture and cultural representation. That felt nice. It felt like something we need to see more of, and I was just happy to see that. The only thing that's kind of missing, and it's not a criticism, just something I noticed in a modern sci-fi novel, is that there's nothing queer here that I could see. All of the relationships that are explored are very straight relationships. I don't remember seeing anything about sexually queer or gender queer stories, which just surprised me. I thought I would, but I didn't. It's not a criticism, just a thing that I personally noticed as a queer reader. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe I missed something. I don't remember. I don't think so. Anyway, How High We Go in the Dark is a perfect sci-fi novel. Please, please read it. It is one of the best modern sci-fi novels I've read in years and years and years, and I already can't wait to dip in and reread some of my favorite stories in here. Subscribe for books.